In my previous video, I described the 5th through 8th adventures found within Journeys through the Radiant Citadel. In this video, I will go over the remaining 5 adventures. I'll try to go over as much details as I can, but do note that I won't cover absolutely everything because these adventures do go quite in depth. If you haven't seen my part 1 or 2 of this video, I'll link it in the description to check it out. Nothing in there is really needed to watch this video, but if you're curious about the previous adventures, they'll be there. With that, let us continue with Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel, Part 3. Chapter 10, Between Tangled Roots The adventure begins as you approach the city of Kalapong. Kalapong is the largest community on the island of Malabulak and stands among verdant fields. The island belongs to an archipelago known as Dayalongon. The trip to Kalapong has been uneventful with travelers and trade wagons regularly passing by. Soon, the pale, vine-colored wall surrounding the town appears in the distance. Suddenly, from the clear sky crackles a bolt of lightning followed by a thunderous screech. Above the town circles a mighty draconic form, an iridescent creature wreathed in lightning and with multiple sets of wings. As smoke begins to rise from Kalapong, the creature dives towards the town. The attack is swift. The creature strafes the town, vanishing among the buildings for an instant, then soars away to the northwest. As you near Kalapong, you see people putting out fires and others tending to the wounded. You ask around as to what happened and learn that a Bakanawa came out of nowhere and attacked. Its lightning breath and brief rampage muse terror, fires, and ruin. A Bakunawa is a kind of dragon said to hold power over the seas and skies. The archipelago of Dayalongon was once protected by a gigantic Bakunawa, but they vanished long ago. A woman, wearing a teal dress embroidered with golden constellations, surveys the destruction. She waves in your direction, then approaches. You arrived at a difficult time. I'd hope to prevent exactly this, she says, gesturing at the fallen building. I am Nimuel. The woman pauses, looking around at the chaos, before addressing you again. Follow me. I know a place where we won't have to worry about others overhearing and there's someone I need you to meet. You follow Nimuel to a quiet nearby courtyard shaded by an ancient tree. When you arrive, a figure steps from the base of the tree. This is Lungtian, and Inonu and Nimuel's partner. Light clothing of leaves and vines grown from Lutian's body, and when Lungtian speaks, their voice sounds like rustling leaves. An Inonu is a spirit of the land, similar to a dryad. Nimuel introduces Lungtian, and the two share the following information. The Bakanawa that attacked Kalapong is named Pangil Nang Buang, and is one of the oldest of its kind. It fought against foreign invaders long ago, but has never been hostile towards the land's people. Pongil was friends to Lungtian, but the Bakanawa disappeared more than 200 years ago. A few weeks ago, Lungtian began having visions of corruption centered on the island of Lambakluha, once a holy place and now a ruined land. Lungtian and Nimual ask you to seek out Pongil Nang Buan, discover what's happened to it, and bring it peace. Before the conversation ends, Lungtian shares one more important piece of information. During the attack, I could feel Pongil Nang Buan, Lungtian whispers. There was a shadow in its spirit, something poisonous and pulsing, a sickness I do not know. The Bakanawa seemed to be fighting with itself. I believe that's why we've seen many injured but no dead among the rubble. Lungtian tells you that Pongil's home was once the island of Lombokluha. The pair wish for you to travel to the island and calm the Bakanawa lest more people become prey to its wrath. You agree and begin your journey to Lombaklua. You can reach Lombaklua in an easy two-day journey by traversing Flames Everlasting, one of the sky bridges that connect the islands. This sky bridge stretches from the island of Malabulak to Lombaklua. The island is largely deserted, but at the end of the Flames Everlasting is a camp called the Final Steps of Courage, home to soldiers and scholars seeking to fight back the dangers infesting the island. Journeying from Kalapong to the foot of the Flames Everlasting Skybridge takes only a few hours. As you near the Skybridge, you find a magnificent bridge that arcs into the air. It stretches high above the trees and over the sea beyond. The span soars without support, its path bending in serpentine curves that stretch into the distance. The bridge is over a hundred feet wide, 
and the statues of stern draconic creatures adorn it. As you approach the foot of the sky bridge, you find a group of five locals with horses resting and sharing a meal at the roadside. The five are well armed and look like hunters. You approach openly, and the group's leader waves you over. Hail, traveler. I'm Paolo Mekapel, and judging by your road, I guess that you've come from Kalapong. Tell me, are the rumors true? If Pongil Nam Boan has returned, I swear by all my ancestors that the monster will die by my hand. Paolo is the group's leader, and he travels with four of his cousins. They belong to the clan known as the Mekapel. They were raised together and share Paolo's conviction that they must slay the Bakanoa. Paolo begins to ask you about the Bakanoa, what it looked like, how it behaved. You can tell Paolo is trying to learn all he can about the Bakanawa, but is less concerned about Kalapong or its people. Paolo tells you that Pongil Nangboan was seen flying away to the southwest and they plan to follow via the sky bridge. Paolo and his cousins hate Pongil due to the Mekapo clan's blood feud with the Bakanawa. During the region's last revolution against foreign aggression 200 years ago, Pongil Nangboan abandoned the defense of the city of Laguna. This resulted in the death of Yurian, the founder of Laguna and the Mekapo clan. Generations of Laguna's hunters have grown up on stories of Pongil Nangboan's betrayal. When Paolo heard word of a Bakanawa seen in disguise, he began to seek the creature so he can settle his clan's blood feud. He asked you to join his group as they head to Lambaklua to slay Pongil Nangboan. Paolo is also certain he and his group can make a profit from selling pieces of the Bakanawa's corpse and he would split the profits with you if you helped. You decline the offer as your mission is to calm the Bakanawa, not kill it. Paolo laughs and says, Yes, yes. I hear those who speak of the monster as though they're gods. But Pongil Nangboan is a god who left my people, my city, and the founder of my clan to die. Surely you understand my position. You nod and decide to work with Paolo's group, traveling to Lambaklua together. Perhaps when the time comes, things may change. A few hours before you reach Lambaklua, you spot your destination. The mist on the horizon parts, revealing a gigantic tree thousands of feet tall, its highest branches hidden by clouds. The great tree's boughs are bent, barren, and lifeless. This tree is Butholong Puno, one of the holy trees of the Dayaolong archipelago that was burnt by invaders long ago. Soon after you spot the tree, the stench of ash permeates the air. The sky bridge descends onto a sizable island overgrown with tangled swamp and covered in a haze tasting of ash. A few acres at the sky bridge's end have been cleared and surrounded by a wooden palisade. Within, simple wooden buildings and dingy tents form an encampment. The camp is called the Final Steps of Courage, and beyond it spreads the blighted landscape of Lombaklua. You follow the sky bridge into the camp, and four sentries stop you, demanding to know what your business is. As you converse with the soldiers, a horn sounds from the camp's south gate. The sentries run toward the opposite side of the camp, while the camp staff scatter. You follow the sound and see several undead attacking the camp's south gates. A moment later, three wraiths that look like spirits of burned victims close in on you and attack. When you defeat the wraith, the soldiers thank you and welcomes you to rest. The soldiers and scholars of the camp are here in hopes of reclaiming Lambaklua and making it safe for resettlement. Their work is slow, as the tortured spirits of the land attack at random intervals. In recent weeks, they've spotted flashes of blue lightning near Bathalong Puno, Pangil Nang Buan's lair. You explain to the soldiers that you're seeking Pangil Nang Buan. They warn you of the danger of the miles of swamp known as the Weeping Pass that you will have to traverse to get to its lair. You thank them for their hospitality, and resume your journey heading for the Weeping Pass. As you enter the Weeping Pass, the ash-heavy air closes in. Decay and ruin are everywhere, from the murky water flowing through the endless swamp to the mildewed vines and the rotting roots of swollen mangrove in the Bayan trees. Traversing the swamps, you come upon a ruined temple called Saro's Zenith. Here, you find an ancient statue of a Bakanawa, cracked with age and covered with unusual vines. Amid a cluster of tangled roots, Three blister-like growth heaves like a breathing thing and glows with a sickly light. These are known as spirit blisters. You destroy the blisters and the spirit of an Inonu appears, 
thanking you for releasing it from the bitter memories trapped within the blister. The spirit shares that it was once a protector of Lombaklua in the temple that stood here. When invaders burned the sacred tree, the Ninonu was overwhelmed by the pain of those who died. The spirit encourages you to destroy any spirit blisters you see. Charred roots the size of buildings surround an open clearing with a broad patch of blackened ground. At the clearing center, wreathing vines with glowing green veins wrap around the massive form of Pongil Nangguan. These vines emanate from four green, blister-like growths entangled amid the great tree's roots. You fend off the wrath of Pongyul Nangguan as you navigate to each of the spirit blisters and destroy them. Once all four have been vanquished, Pongyul Nangguan is cleansed of the corruption. The Bakanawa thanks you for saving it and explain what has happened. Pongyul Nangguan has long dwelled on the dangerous island of Lombaklua. Its dwelling lies before the great tree temple called Bathalong Puno, a massive, mighty sacred tree that was long ago burned by invaders. In the years that followed the tree's desecration, evil spirits infested the land. These foul spirits caused unnatural growths to manifest spirit blisters that corrupted the land and its creatures. While the ancient Bakanawa slept, strangling roots enveloped it and poured poison into its being for centuries. When the Bakanawa awoke, its corruption caused it to hate all it once loved. After raging across Lambaklua, it sought its ancient spirit companion, Lungtian. But its feelings of companionship have turned to rage, and it wreaks vast destruction in its search. The Bakanawa remembers Lungtian fondly and was able to stop itself from harming the people of Kalapong when it sensed the Ninonu's presence. You mentioned the city of Laguna, and Pongyul Nangboan expresses remorse for not being there when the city was attacked. The Bakanawa and Yurian Makapol, Paolo's ancestor, were close friends. The day prior to the attack, the two had a disagreement. Pongyil Nangboan left Laguna to clear its head and heard about the violence too late. After your conversation, the Bakanawa accompanies you back to Kalapong. Pongyil Nangboan apologizes to the townfolk and explains the cause of the attack, promising to aid in restoring the town. Nimuel and Lungtian thank you for your aid and extend an internal gratitude. Chapter 11 Shadow of the Sun The adventure begins when you arrive in Akar and Sangar. The city is filled with locals anticipating the festival of Shabe Taban. Hundreds of people flock to Three Sun Square in advance of Shabe Taban, the brilliant night. Booths selling steaming rice, tangy stews, and sun-shaped desserts fill the air with delectable fragrances. Nearby, members of the Bright Guard, Akar and Sangar's Holy Order of Protectors, patrol the arch balconies of their headquarters, the Noble Jewel. Soon after you arrive, an ear-splitting crash pierces the air. Five figures wearing snarling crimson masks clamber atop stalls, each raising a cone-like device to their mouth. The mass figures' voices emanate from the contraptions amplified over the crowd. Down with the triants! Let the embers light the way! These mass figures are anarchists known as the Ashen Heirs. The Ashen Heirs decry the Bright Guard as oppressive brutes masquerading as pious saints. While some onlookers may agree, no one is fool enough to draw attention to themselves by openly supporting either side. Suddenly, you feel a vibration beneath your feet. Stone cracks and people scream as a massive purple worm erupts from the center of the square. You realize the device of the Ashen Heirs is irritating the creature and make your way to destroy them. As you do so, a blue-skinned angel known as Apari appears and aids in evacuating the citizens. Soon, the purple worm retreats down the hole it came from. The angel announces, I am Artavazda, harbinger of the Bright Guard in Atasha's righteous hand. Artavazda explains that in the lead-up to Shabe Taban, the Bright Guard has seen many disruptions. The angel asks you to work with the Bright Guard until the festival ends in a few days, protecting the people from dramatic displays that turn dangerous. Though the angels who serve Atosh are powerful, they are too few to support the Bright Guard during times of trouble. Atosh worries for the safety of his people, the angel says. Atosh is the current ruler for these lands. The angel continues, if the Ashen Heirs are left unchecked, I fear Tosh will cancel the celebrations that impose martial law until the rebels' threat is ended. Will you help me prevent this? You agree with the Angel, noting how things have turned out to be such a mess. 
As things calm down in Three Sun Square, the Bright Guard places any remaining Ashen heirs under arrest. Two white and gold clad Bright Guards question a calm elf woman with dark hair, sharp green eyes, and a pink tunic over a red dress. The Bright Guards place manacles on the elf. Arta Vazda explains that she is an infamous agitator who is worth questioning about her involvement in today's incident. You begin to peruse the city and eventually capture some Ashen heirs. In exchange for being let go, they tell you the following information. The Ashen heirs were ordered to find the Samovar, an iron flask with a genie inside, and return it to their hideout. Their hideout is an abandoned temple in the old city and is being led by a wise sage named Navid. They hand you their mask and share the secret passphrase that will allow you to enter the hideout. After contending with the members of the Ashen Heirs, you are approached by a member of another revolutionary group, the Silent Roar. The agent says that your old friend Lale is anxious to see you, then walks away. You follow the agent to a bakery known as Gorbani Bakery. Inside, you meet a brown elf with a prosthetic arm named Lale. Lale is the sister of Afsun Gorbani, who was the individual arrested by the Bright Guard earlier. Afsun secretly leads the Silent Roar. They are a coalition of rebels that seek to non-violently overthrow Ataj and put Akar and Sangar's people in power for the betterment of the city-state. Although the Silent Roar are rebels, they are not affiliated with the destructive Ashen Heirs. Lale has received word that Afsun was not released after her questioning and seeks information on where her sister is being held. She asks you to keep your ears open for any information about her sister. She promises that her agents will obtain any resources that would you She promises that her agents will obtain any resources that you would need and provides the location of the Ashen Heirs hideout. In exchange, you agree to help Lale in regards to her sister. She thanks you and wishes you luck. With that, you set off out of the city and traverse to the Ashen Heirs hideout. As you approach the hideout, you see a small temple within a courtyard surrounded by an iron fence. You traverse within and eventually make it to the leader of the hideout. Before you stands an Ifridi named Navid who is currently disguised as a human. You learn from Navid that the Ashen Heirs plan to overthrow the government and start it anew. Afterwards, the Ifridi attacks you and you battle him before he makes his escape through the plane shift spell, severely weakened. You travel back to Artavazda and tell them about the Ifridi. Navid's downfall puts the Pari's mind at ease and they present to you your second assignment. Artavazda has learned the Silent Roar is planning a gathering tonight at the Twilight Rose Theater. The Silent Roar's dedication to nonviolent protests makes it less of a threat than the Ashen Heirs, but Atash doesn't tolerate dissent. Artavazda hopes you can gather intelligence on the group and its plan prior to Brightguard raiding the theater. Whether you choose to accept her mission or decline it in favor of aiding the Silent Roar, you make a small walk to the Twilight Rose. As you approach, you see a two-story circular theater. It is covered in boards indicating that it has been shut down for some time. As you enter, you find an actor performing on a stage. The audience watch an actor costumed as a royal perform an impassioned monologue. We stand on a steep and dreadful precipice, but we can hide no longer, the actor proclaims. Leap, my kindred, for our true home lies just beyond the darkness. The play being performed is called The First Queen, which tells the triumphant story of the first ruler of Akar and Sagar and the deliverance of her people from a fearsome demon. Here you find Lale, who explains that the Silent Roar has arranged a plan to free Afsun. She plans on holding a diversion in the city and wish for you to save Afsun, who is currently being held at the pedestal of judgment. You decide to travel there and investigate the facility yourself. A little way from the city, you travel to the pedestal of judgment. Here you find a stone disc whose ancient magic keeps it hovering high above the landscape. You manage to find a way to reach the disc in the sky and find Afsun Gorbani imprisoned in the crystal. If you choose to align with the Silent Roar, here's where you will free Afsun from her prison. In doing so, you reunite Lale and her sister and the two decide to lie low in the meantime. If you aligned with the Bright Guard, you defend the crystal prison from the members of the Silent Roar that wish to free her. After doing so, you report to Artavazda who thanks you for keeping the elf imprisoned. They present you with a cloak which symbolizes the wearer as a friend of the Bright Guard. Chapter 12 The Night Sees Succor The adventure begins with you arriving in the city of Janai via a ship at the invitation of an official. The ship passes through swirling fog that parts to reveal distant cliffs. A port emerges from the mist, nestled among mangroves. Elaborate mud brick buildings in chalky pastel colors line the shore. 
A porter named Anna Dua greets you and offers to escort you to their inn. After you retire for the night, you hear a distant music that provides an almost hypnotic undertone. Then shouts for help ring out, shattering the peace. You follow the sound into a common room surrounded by mist. Amid the mist are two terrified figures who cry out, Please, they're coming after us. We can't lose them again. These are spirits that are being tormented by a wraith that looks like a faceless sea raider. The wraith looks at you, signals the spirits towards you, and all three attack you. When the wraith is defeated, the surviving spirits linger and introduce themselves as Derek and Violet. They were separated from their families and taken from their homes long ago. The ship they were on, Gerskamen, sank and they were lost at sea along with some important tomes. They plead for you to find their resting place and reclaim the tomes. Only then may they rest in peace. Soon, the mist in the room swirls faster and all that remains is a puddle of water where the spirits once stood. The puddles of water form into sigils representing the Black Mist Way in the Black Throne Arts. The next morning, guards wearing long black tunics called the Light Sea Lancers approach you. They escort you to the Castle Janai, an onyx-colored building made of mud and wooden supports that towers over the surrounding structures. Here, you meet a man with gray hair wearing a purple robe. He introduces himself as Atibapa, one of the leaders of Janai known as the People's Stewards. He asks you to recount what you saw the previous night. You do so, and he records any information that you have provided. Atibapa tells you that the spirits you saw the other night are called Haints, spirits born of sorrow. They were often seen during the passage of vultures, an event in which Raider attacked the people of the nation. He believes the appearance of the sigils you saw from the two Haints is a sign to restore Janai's traditions, an endeavor known as the Will of the Insurgent Tides. In centuries past, the people of Janai employed mystical practices known as the Black Mist Way and the defense of martial strategies called the Black Throne Arts to protect their land. During a period called the Passage of Vultures, raiders assailed the nation and kidnapped its people. Many of those captured escaped into the ocean to find a new aquatic realm called Janya. These escapees included the most skilled practitioners of both arts, but the writings that recorded their lore was lost. Atibapa tells you, For centuries, we have dreamed of reclaiming the Black Mist Way and the Black Throne Arts so our people can defend their lands and our neighbors with all the strength of the past. In regards to the ship, Gerskamen, it was a raiding ship that captured Janaians, took over, and sank during the passage of vultures. The spirits you encountered likely died in the struggle before the ship sank. Atibapa explains he wants you to find the wreck and any hint of Janai's lost lore still aboard. He admits that finding the Gitzgamen won't be easy. The People's Regents knows the undersea folk of Janya have detailed records of wreck sites and other points of interest around their undersea city. Atibapa tells you that during the passage of vultures, countless captured Janaians leaped from the ship of marauders like raindrops falling into the sea. In the Midnight Deaths, those ancient Janaians called upon their magic and that of the Night Sea, and they were transformed into beings dubbed Night Sea Children, gifted with the ability to live in the deep. Over centuries, they became the civilization known as Janya. You agree to their request and venture off into the town, preparing for your mission. As you do so, a figure wearing pale blue robes approaches, her face obscured by a blue veil. The people's stewards have lost their way, she whispers. Many speak of your mystic experiences last night, of what they might mean, and of what causes are championed by those seemingly at the center of them. The whispering figure identifies herself only as the blue and conveys the message that Geneva of the Night Revelers has invited you to the Ancestor's Dance House for a meeting that night. She explains that it is to discuss Atibapa's folly and Geneva's glorious revelry. The Blue then takes her leave. Out of curiosity, you search for Ancestor's Dance House and find it easily. When you arrive, the Blue is waiting for you, leading you through the building. A captivating drumbeat grows louder as the Blue leads you along a corridor, at the end of which a cavernous ballroom opens up. The Blue leads you to a nearly 7 foot tall figure draped in a complex arrangement of robes and sashes. The figure greets you. Welcome, I am Geneva, and we have much to discuss. Geneva asks you about the spirits you saw, but quickly grows bored and excitedly changes the topic. We will speak more, friends, but first, let us partake in the night revelry. With that, he leaves into the crowd. You join in the festives and dance, drum, and debate with the guest in the ballroom. After doing so, Geneva circles back to you. Word comes to Geneva of meetings between the so-called people's stewards and you, yes? 
in whispers of sigils seen where the spirits of the past are wrought to life by pains. In whispers of sigils seen where the past. In whispers of sigils seen where the spirits of the past are wrought. In whispers of sigils seen where the spirits of the past are wrought to life by ancient pain. Atibapa and I know those sigils well, but I offer you a chance to turn from his empty past and help build the future for Janai. He proposes that if you find the lore, you should bring it to the Night Revelers instead of the people's stewards. The Night Revelers hope to take these ancient traditions and forge them into something more powerful. You tell him that you would consider it and leave the Ancestor's Dawn's house to retire for the night. In the morning, you make your way to the docks and prepare for voyage. You board a boat known as the Beaten Moon. Two light sea lancers wearing green-blue armor and matching silk cloaks stand on the deck. As you approach, a cheerful lancer introduces himself as Garo. He is friendly and explains that the two have been informed of your mission and are eager to help. His brooding companion, Kisarua, encourages you to board swiftly so they can embark. Kisarua is initially sour, but her mood lightens towards you when you help prepare the ship. Once the beaten moon is underway, its journey takes two hours. The beaten moon's journey across the calm shallow waters known as the Light Sea is uneventful. Eventually, the water darkens as the ship crosses the edge of the continental shelf, entering the night sea. The two light sea lancers furl the sails and drop a sea anchor at the gateway to Janya, an area of glassy open water. You take the plunge and make your way to Janya. After you descend approximately 3,000 feet, you spot something unexpected. From the darkness below glides a glowing, translucent long ship, its oars bringing it just above you. A cloudiness covers the deck, swirling into forms vaguely resembling people. The name Gerskamen is plainly emblazoned on the ghost ship's hull. As the ship comes alongside you, the first mate is joined by four crew members who are little more than eerie light and drifting skulls. At first, it appears they are searching for something. Once they see you, however, the hostile undead snarl challenges and attack. You fend them off in the underwater battle, slaying the undead creature. Once they are destroyed, the ghost ship breaks apart as if wrecked by a spectral storm and disappears. As you near the sea floor, a pearlescent haze cuts through the darkness. Below, you see a shimmering dome of light, a great magical barrier that shelters the city below. A magical vista spreads beneath the dome, the undersea city of Janya. As you take in the beauty of the city, a figure approaches you. The figure has kelp-colored hair and stingray-colored skin. He introduces himself as Zoshi Ade, an emissary of the High Court of Janya. You relate your story of the ship's attack, and Zoshi Ade ponders for a moment. Many of the wreck sites dotting the sea floor around Janya are known to be haunted, but he's never heard of similar manifestation in open water. Zoshi Ade offers to take you to Zisada, for they may have more information for you. He escorts you to the Cerulean Lyceum, Janya's Great Bardic College. Zoshi Ade leads you to a private audience occupied by a single Janyan wearing fine billowing robes. This is Zisada. Zisada rises without introducing herself and is initially indifferent towards you. As soon as you speak, Zisada interrupts and orders you to introduce yourself rather than first sharing her own name. You do so and mention the ghost ship. Zisada tensely reports that sightings of a ghostly vessel above Janya began several days ago. She remembers the name Gerskamen and says that they know the location of its wreckage. Before you can share all the details of your mission with Zisada, the door to her suite bursts open and a figure swims in. Brother Brumane, another member of the High Court. Brother Brumane announces he learned of a surface world hero coming to Janya. The two individuals want to learn the scope of your mission. They largely ignore each other as they each attempt to win you to their side. Zasada tries to discern whether you're working for the people's stewards and is pleased if you are. At the same time, Brother Brumane tries to find out if you're working for the Night Revelers. Zasada's group the Janias wishes for you to bring her the old lore aboard the Gaskamen so they can study it. Brother Brumane's group, the New Giants, want Giants to forge their own identity. He wishes for you to find the lore to destroy it. Whichever you choose, they give you the location of the Gaskamen and you make your way there. Once there, you find a trench covered in midnight colored coral. As the bottom of the trench comes into view, you see the wreckage of the Gaskamen. You explore the ship and eventually come upon a nearby ruin. Within the ruin is a spectral armored figure with blazing emerald eyes. More fools of Janai? he asks. I'm the captain of the Gerskamen, and you will meet the same fate as all who set foot upon my vessel. 
you fight the captain to the death and explore more of the ship, encountering an abolith named Ilk. Ilk recently discovered this ruin. It was attracted here by the aura of the undead still suffering from the legacy of the passage of vultures. In investigating the site, Ilk disrupted the unquiet spirits of the Gaskamen. It has been using magic to control the wraiths that arose from the terrible ship. Ilk wants to know what brought you here, and you inform it of the lost lore. In doing so, the Abolith realizes the value of the tomes and calls upon the lingering crew to attack. You slay the Abolith and make your way into its lair, where you find a library. Soon after you enter the room, the friendly Haint, Derek, appears joined by Violet. Upon recognizing you, Derek thanks you for coming to recover the tomes he and Violet have been guarding for so long. Derek then shows you where the lost tomes are in this library. Once you finish exploring, where you go next is up to you. No matter the fate of the books of lore, you are celebrated by some and vilified by others. In any case, many in both Janai and Janya come to wonder what other powerful Janaian wisdom might rest in the deep, waiting to be rediscovered. Chapter 13 Buried Dynasty your adventure begins with an invitation from Secretary Wei to meet you in the city of Yongjing to investigate some ruins. For one reason or another, you accept her invitation and you make your way to the city. The city of Yongjing is a bustling network of tightly packed ornate buildings. As you traverse the city, you make your way to the Hall of Divine Wisdom where Secretary Wei may be found. Hundreds of petitioners mill about, all hoping to speak to the Emperor. Ministers circulate among them, easily distinguishable by their winged black caps. Soon, a minister approaches you. You explain of your meeting with Secretary Wei, and the minister ushers you forward with a bow. Eventually, you are guided to an elegant meeting room. After a short wait, a middle-aged woman wearing fine red robes enter the room. She thanks you for answering her call and for your interest in investigating the historic ruins of Old Yongjing. She introduces herself as Secretary Wei and explains to you the assignment. There is an expedition that seeks to collect accounts and relics from past rulers for the benefit of future ones. Historians believe that the palace of the last ruler of the Yun Dynasty, known as the Mountain Cloud Empress, lies in the old city beneath present-day Yongjing. Secretary Wei wishes for you to guard her hand-picked scholars as they delve into the old city and recover an old diary. Soon, a young human enters the room, bows, and introduces themselves as Lu Zhongyin. They are the expedition's lead historian. Secretary Wei wishes Secretary Wei presents a contract to you that consists of an initial payment and another amount when Lu Zhongyin is returned safely. You accept her mission and sign the contract, thus sealing your servitude. After cashing in your contract, you and Zhang Yin make your way to an empty basement. Zhang Yin breaks the wall and begins the exploration of the Yun Dynasty ruins of the old city. As you explore the Yun Dynasty ruins, you find the diaries along with a mirror containing the trapped soul of the Mountain Cloud's Empress' favorite spouse. Zhang Yin seems to be disappointed with your findings, cursing that there's no dragon's blessing in here. The name of the trapped soul is Liao Gong and appears as the image of a young female dwarf. You converse with the dwarf and learn that the ruined palace was once her home. She was the favorite spouse of the Mountain Cloud Empress, the last ruler of the Yun Dynasty. The Empress was obsessed with attaining immortality. Not wanting Liao Gong to grow old while she sought the key to everlasting life, the Empress forced her love to enter the mirror to await her eventual triumph. You ask Liao Gong about what Dragon's Blessing is. She tells you that it is a powder that, when mixed with a potion of longevity, could give one an everlasting life. She asks you to free her from the mirror and take her to the garden in the ruins. You agree to free her and guide her to the garden. In the center is a fountain which Liao Gong activates, filling it with water. For a moment, the garden is magically restored, but after a minute, the vibrancy vanishes and the area returns to normal. An emotional Liao Gong thanks you for taking her here. You make your way to the entrance, preparing to leave but find rumbling that fills the tunnels. After a while, all goes quiet again, but now a haze of dust hangs in the air. You find the entrance of the ruins closed off with rubble, and it seems as though you are trapped. Zhang Yin contacts Secretary Wei and informs her of the cave-in. A few minutes later, a shimmering portal forms in front of you and you step through into the unknown. As you pass through the portal, you appear in the center of a jade golem tomb. The walls of this hexagonal stone chamber are covered with the pale white veins of faintly glowing jade. Dozens of alcoves holding jade statues of soldiers line the rest of the chamber's perimeter. 
bodies are scattered around the room, some clothed in finery, some in rags, all in states of decay. A shimmering image of Secretary Wei appears in the center of the chamber. Your service is much appreciated, the image says grimly, but you've learned just enough to be dangerous. I won't allow our great nation to succumb to the same chaos as the Yun Dynasty. The secretary then hesitates and the image wavers. Zhong Yin, I will not be retrieving you as planned, she says. I am sorry. The image flickers, then vanishes. Zhong Yin is shocked at Secretary Wei's betrayal. After the image of Secretary Wei fades, a sculpted soldier detaches from its alcove, then steps forward to attack. The two of you fend them off the best you can until you notice a bronze gate with a magic seal. You solve the puzzle of the magic seal and make your way out of the room. As you traverse, Zhang Yin tells you the true purpose of your mission. Secretary Wei had sent you in to find a magical object known as Dragon's Blessing. With it, one can make a potion that would allow for internal life. The current emperor is dying and Secretary Wei hopes this potion will prevent the death. As the two of you make it through the hall, you come upon a grotto. An enormous gold dragon lies coiled against the near wall of this gloomy chamber, shackled to the ground. Surrounding the dragon are three mages that work for Secretary Wei. Seeing this dragon in distress, you defeat the mages and remove the shackles that bind the gold dragon. When freed, the gold dragon thanks you and introduces himself as Tu Lao. The mages here have captured the gold dragon in hopes of discovering a method in creating the dragon's blessing, but have been met with no success. Tu Lao tells you that the Emperor is dying, but doesn't know it yet. In a few months, when he next uses a potion of longevity to extend his life, he'll learn that the Imperial supply of Dragon's Blessing has been depleted, and this potion might age him rather than adding years to his life. Currently, only the Alchemist and the Grand Secretary Wei knows of this. Further down the grotto is an exit tunnel, which the Dragon quickly uses to make his escape. You attempt to follow him down the small opening, and when you emerge from the other side, you find a windowless room with a wooden ceiling. At the ceiling of the room is a trapdoor, and above you comes the sound of someone singing. You open the trapdoor and emerge onto a stage. Two singers wearing heavy makeup freeze in mid-embrace as you make your presence known. Sitting on a raised dais in the center of the audience is the White Jade Emperor, dressed in magnificent yellow and gold robes. Among the audience is also Secretary Wei, watching you with spiteful eyes. The guards in the area prepare to apprehend you, but you call out to the Emperor. In doing so, the Emperor raises his right hand and the guards stop. With the aid of Zhong Yin, you provide proof of the events that have transpired regarding the Dragon's Blessing and Secretary Wei's betrayal. The Emperor is convinced of your story and demands that Secretary Wei explains herself. She does so, explaining that what she did was to protect the peace of Yong Jin. The Emperor dismisses you afterwards, but commands Secretary Wei to stay for a private audience. Afterwards, you and Zhang Yin are invited to a private audience with the Emperor in which he rewards you. It turns out that Grand Secretary Wei has been taken into custody, and the Emperor is still deciding what to do with her. It seems as though he favors exiling her, but he is certainly open to suggestions. You leave the Emperor's presence after the discussion. As you leave, you catch a glimpse of something strange the shadow of a serpentine dragon soaring through the sky. While you may think nothing of it, it is certain that this is an omen of good luck. Chapter 14 Orchid of the Invisible Mountain As the adventure begins, you are traveling to the Sarire Sugar Mill in the land of Atagua. The surrounding flatland is hot, and few clouds provide a respite from the relentless sun. As the Sarire Sugar Mill comes into view, the smell of cooking sugar canes rises on the breeze. Ahead stands a sugar mill, a massive wooden shed with a pointed roof. An otherworldly shimmer warps the air around the mill, like a haze of silver rain that vanishes as quickly as it appears. A moment later, a scream rings out, followed by a crash. A column of smoke rises through the structure's roof. Workers race toward the building as smoke billows from the roof and doors. Through the broad, open doors of the mill, you see that the interior has collapsed into a great sinkhole. Large overturned kettles spill boiling sugarcane juice across the broken floor, and the fires that once heated those kettles leap up nearby columns and race along the thatch reed roof. A half dozen workers have fallen into the sinkhole and struggle to clamber out. Over the noise, you notice an eerie whistling emanating from no place in particular. Checking the sinkhole, you see that the earth of its walls is dry and dead, like it's from somewhere else entirely. A moment after you look in the hole, two large, gaunt, bipedal figures appears within. 
These are creatures from the far realm called Whistlers. You slay the creatures, thus saving the workers from a horrible death. Suddenly, a tearing sound precedes the appearance of a silvery ripple hovering in the air nearby. From the anomaly, a frantic-looking scarlet macaw shoots forth trailing silvery motes. A figure appears behind the bird, pushing as though trying to pass through, but held fast by the portal's flickering magic. Is anyone there? A woman in a beaded vest shouts. I can see you, but I can't get through. Listen, please, the woman calls. I'm Yorana. The ghost orchid Tepui is under siege by alien creatures. Shimagwa, our guardian, has fallen into a deathly slumber. If the great spirit dies, all is lost. If you are brave souls, seek the Tepui. Find the portal in the Yanos. Nene knows the way, but be... With a sound like breaking glass, the rift collapses and is gone. A macaw that passed through the rift, named Nene, squawks as he circles frantically. Though the mill can't be saved, the workers prevent the fire from spreading. You decide to help them after witnessing such a tragedy. As you work, several laborers whisper fearfully, claiming they saw whistlers. They're a well-known local legend, but few have ever seen one until now. Soon after the mill collapses, its owner, Alphod's sugarman Rubina Zumdi, arrives on the scene, escorted by several bodyguards. Workers quickly describe to Alphonse what happened. The sugarman asks you to join in the conversation, foregoing introductions to get to the heart of the situation. The sugarman is astonished to hear of the sinkhole. He's thoughtful when you suggest a planar disturbance was responsible for it. He pays particular attention when you tell him of Yarana's words. Once he has a grasp of the situation, the sugarman orders his bodyguards to help the survivors, assess the damage to the mill, and leave to speak with you alone. Alphonse leads you into the privacy of a storeroom and thanks you for your aid. He focuses in on what Yorana told you. The Sugar Man explains that Atuguan's dream vividly of a great tepui, a tabletop mountain surrounded by jungle. The secret behind these dreams is found in the oldest legends, which speak of the ghost orchard tepui existing simultaneously in the Llanos and in the Feywild parallel to Atugua. The source of the dreams is a powerful crystal called the Sleeping Stone, which many who dream have seen alongside magical ghost orchids growing in the crystalline caverns below the Tepue summit. The white seed pod of a ghost orchid is said to have the power to bring the dead back to life. The sugar man wants you to bring him one of these white seed pods. The macaw floating nearby is anxious to return to Yorana. Long ago, Nene traveled across the grasslands of Atugua, known as the Yanos, with Yorana. He knows the location of the secret gateway that leads from Atugua to the ghost orchid Tepui. You decide to follow Nene's direction, hoping to make it to Yorana. Eventually, the macaw's direction guides you to a giant termite mound on the eastern side of the Yanos. Entering the mound, the Yanos vanishes, replaced by the earthy scent of jungle. As you emerge through a hollow in a large tree, thick rainforest vegetation surrounds you. A roaring waterfall cascades down the tepui, and a well-trodden path twists towards it. This is the land known as the Ghost Orchid Tepui, found in the Feywild. You explore the area, making it into a crystal cavern hidden within. Here, you find a 10-foot tall chipped gray crystal that rises from a ledge. On the rock shelf behind it, a woman stands near a large anaconda that's coiled and motionless. This creature is known as Chimagua. The woman calls for you to come quickly, explaining that she is Yorana and the creature beside her is dying. As soon as you approach, Yorana attacks you, seemingly under something's control. She struggles to raise a finger and points to a pool. You investigate the pool and find two aboliths lurking in the murky water. Slaying the aboliths, you free Yorana from her mind control. Afterwards, Yorana thanks you for heeding her call. The Sleeping Stone, a focus of Chimagwa's power, has sent the spirits some visions of a far realm terror known as the Drought Elder that's trying to exert control over Atagwa. Recently, creatures from the Far Realm slipped from Atagwa into the Ghost Orchid Tepui and attacked Chimagwa. The invaders broke the Sleeping Stone and spirited a piece of it away, putting Chimagwa into a death-like slumber. Yorana believes they returned the fragment to the Drought Elder, which is using it to draw power from the nightmares of Atagwa's people. She beseeches you to help by stealing into the Drought Elder's domain and recovering the stolen fragment. A relic of Atagwa's past hold the key to reaching the Drought Elder, Yorana says. The Hammock of Worlds once allowed people to visit Chimagua using the Ghost Orchid Tepui's connection to Atagua, but with the Far Realm's influence affecting the land, the Hammock could likely follow those corrupted planar connections as well, creating a path to the Drought Elder. If it's to work, we must move quickly. 
She tells you that the Hammock of Worlds is being held by one of the most ancient beings in Atagua, the Dawn Mother. The Dawn Mother is an ageless giant that wanders the Llanos and is set to call forth the sun every morning. She frequents an oasis called the Basket. Once you have the hammock, you must take it to the mystics known as the Green Doctors at the Silver Tapir Monastery. Agreeing to her request, you rush off into the portal and leave the Feywild. From here, you make your way to the basket, and as you near it, you find a Thrykreen named Chichak. Her people were camped at the basket when a terrible storm appeared out of nowhere. Soon after, a terrifying, root-covered giant, the Dawn Mother, appeared and attacked her people without provocation. The two of you hastily make your way to the basket. Numerous Thrykreen dash through the tall grass, attempting to avoid the steps of a massive figure. A gigantic, ancient woman dressed in thick tree roots and vines stomps after the mantis folk. Eventually, you calm down the Dawn Mother from her rage and explain that she's been suffering terrible dreams. You tell her of your situation, and she rummages through the vines covering her, handing you the Hammock of Worlds. With the hammock, you travel to the Silver Tapper Monastery in search of the Green Doctors. As you approach it, you see a large, oxidized silver statue of a tapir that stands before a broad stone structure. Dozens of people stand outside the building, many wearing distinctive green sashes. An elder green doctor named Malacio steps from the crowd with Nene perched on her shoulder. Malacio understands that you have been sent to fetch the Hammock of World and seek to use it to travel to the Far Realm. She believes this can be done, though it hasn't been tried before. At sunset, the ritual for travel through the Hammock of World begins. Two wizened trees stand before the Silver Tapper Monastery, their ancient boughs lit by dust light. Between them stretches the Hammock of Worlds, its patterned fabric loose and empty. Soon, the Green Doctors and other visitors who have come to participate in the ritual begin a rhythmic drumming. All around the monastery, the dance begins with the sound of drums, flutes, harps, and chants rising. As they do, the hammock sags and an otherworldly glow emanates from within it. At the height of the ritual, Malacio uses the hammock to open a portal to the Far Realm. You step into the portal, finding yourself in the Drought Elder. The Drought Elder rots within a region of the Far Realm filled with shadows and dead stars. You emerge within the gigantic, lifeless, yet still malicious being. Navigating through the creatures, you fight off the strange aberrations of the Far Realm such as the Whistlers. When you make it to the mandible of the creature, you find the Sleeping Stone Shard. You claim the Shard of the Sleeping Stone and return through the portal. At your return, Malacio greets you and uses the Hammock of Worlds to speed you back to the Ghost Orchid Tepui. There, you find Yorana attending the weakened Chimagua. You hand over the fragment of the Sleeping Stone, returning it whole. Afterwards, the crystal glows in a rainbow of colors. With the Tepui's magic and the Guardian restored, the nightmares and Far Realm incursions plaguing Atagua cease. Jesus Christ, this took a long time to make. <laughs> Thank you guys for being so patient. I know this took a long time to make. It was like over three weeks at this point, but I put in a lot of time of the uh, of the script and the editing. I tried to shorten this one down because I noticed the other ones are getting a bit long, and I didn't want the entire series to be more than three hours. Rather, I didn't want it to be much more than three hours. I'm not quite sure how long the uh, entire series is, actually. But I'll double check on it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. And if uh, you guys enjoyed the new uh, editing style, let me know. I really had fun uh, working with the new editing style. And uh, hopefully I plan on editing much more of my videos in the same way. If you guys don't like it, just let me know. I'll go back to my old way. Although this way does seem to be much more convenient for me. It takes a lot longer, but it's certainly so much more convenient. <laughs> well, if you guys enjoyed the video, do give me a like and subscribe. And yeah, if you enjoyed the series, give me a like and subscribe as well. Thanks!